Amen. John chapter 8, uh, verses 1 through 11, we uh, looked at extensively uh, last week as we looked at the woman caught in the act of adultery. And we see from <clears throat> uh, this, as we studied it last week, how that this passage of Scripture is sometimes used to try to say that we cannot be judgmental when it comes to people who are living in sin uh, because we ourselves are not perfect people. And that's not at all what is being said here in this context. What is said here is uh, by Jesus to those who caught her and brought her to Jesus, he's saying to them, you're sinning in what you're doing. You're doing wrong in, in bringing her to me. You're not following God's law in doing this. So you who were without sin cast the first stone. And that's what he's referring to. And uh, it's not the fact that Jesus was trying to uh, uh, break the law of Moses. If he did that and let her off the hook, then he would be sinning. He would be violating the law. And therefore, uh, he couldn't be our Savior. But he is upholding the law and the proper use of the law. And they brought her and not the man. They brought her uh, to Jesus for him to make a decision, and their motive was impure. We see that they wanted to find something to accuse him by, verse 6. They are testing Jesus, that they might have something which to accuse him. That was the whole purpose of doing it. So their motive and their purpose was to find something wrong with Jesus and to uh, try to catch him so that they can accuse him of something but Jesus gives in his law a very clear teaching of what is to happen in divorce and remarriage look at Matthew chapter 5 hold your place here and turn to Matthew chapter 5 and verse uh, 31 and 32 we have the law of Christ concerning who can divorce and remarry Uh, the the rule of the Bible and the, the New Testament is Marriage is for life. One man, one woman for life. There is only one exception to that rule. And Jesus gives the exception here in Matthew 5, 31 and 32. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except fornication, which is sexual immorality translated in other places, causes her to commit adultery and whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery so when you look at what jesus is saying here in matthew 5 and verse 32 he's saying if you're going to divorce it must be for fornication that you may marry another that is the reason why you can divorce and remarry but if it's done for any other reason then there cannot be a remarriage and if that happens that becomes adultery Look at the same book, Matthew 19. Matthew 19. And verse 9, the whole context here is dealing with divorce and remarriage. And Jesus says to those who are asking him about that uh, very subject, he gets back to the the Genesis account and said, God made them male and female, verse 4. The man is to leave his father and be joined to his wife, one man, one woman. And they are to become one flesh, what God has joined together. They're no longer two, but one flesh, what God has joined together. Let not man separate, verse 6. In other words, it's one man, one woman for life. That is the rule. Here's the one exception again in verse 9. I say unto you, whoever divorces his wife except for fornication and marries another commits adultery. And whoever marries her who is divorced commits adultery. And this is... uh, the law of Jesus Christ under the New Testament concerning proper procedure when it comes to uh, divorce and remarriage. And so the divorce and the remarriage has to be according to the exception that Jesus gives in Matthew 5.32, Matthew 19.9, or else when a person remarries, they enter into adultery. And that's an unscriptural or unbiblical marriage that will... Um, cause a person to lose their soul and therefore uh, that's why the Bible is so strict when it comes to uh, who can divorce and why they can divorce so 
Jesus is not letting this woman off the hook when you go back to John chapter 8. He's just saying the law of Moses, the procedure in the law of Moses is not being followed. And then he says there uh, in verse 10, Jesus raised himself up, John 8 and verse 10, and, uh, and saw no one but the woman and said to her, Woman, where are your accusers? Has no one condemned you? In other words, are you going to be put to death? Or where are your accusers in this? Verse 11. She said, no one, Lord. He said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. In other words, Jesus didn't have the authority to condemn her according to the law of Moses and stone her to death. He's not saying, oh, you're okay. He's saying, you go your way and sin no more. He's in essence telling her to repent. They could not do what Moses said to do because they didn't follow the proper procedure. That's why Jesus said they were in sin in what they were doing. They were convicted of that in verse 9. That's why they dropped their rocks, their stones, or whatever, and left, uh, beginning with the oldest to the youngest. And so there was no one there to execute her. And Jesus said, you go your way and sin no more. He did not say, go your way and sin some more. And that's what a lot of people think, and that's what they teach, in essence, in their doctrine. Go away and sin some more, and grace will cover it. We know the Bible says very differently when it comes to our behavior when we become uh, a follower of Jesus Christ. Uh, Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Paul by the Holy Spirit says, Romans 6, verse 1 and 2, what shall, these, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now you insert the word adultery there. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in adultery that grace may abound? Certainly not. Verse 2. How shall we who have died to sin live any longer in it? You insert the word adultery there. Certainly not. How shall we who die to adultery live any longer in it? And you can insert any sin there. Fornication, homosexuality, uh, lust, any kind of vice, murder, um, thievery, and we cannot live in it. You die to it when you repent. Therefore, it has to come to an end. So that's why Jesus said, in John 8 and verse 11, uh, go your way and sin no more. Now, any questions or comments about that before we go any further? Then he says in verse 12, this is one of two places he's going to say, I am the light of the world. He's going to say it here, and he's going to say it in the next chapter. One of the I am statements of John. Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. And I think it's very significant that he would say this here because what was Jesus doing? He was shining a light on what the Jews were doing and trying to accuse him and on the life of that woman that was accused of adultery. He was there as a light. He's shown a light on that. It was revealing God's will. And he's the light of the world. That concept of light there, of course, we understand uh, God created light in Genesis' uh, account of creation, day one of Genesis. We understand the importance of light and how essential it is. Without uh, the sun uh, being in the sky, there could be no biological life on earth. We understand how that is essential in the physical realm and in the spiritual realm. Jesus is that light that gives spiritual life. He will have the light of life. Darkness here, light and darkness in the book of John and in all of John's writings indicates righteousness up against wickedness. Light being righteousness, being God's will. 1 John 1 and verse 5, God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. 
He's perfect. He's pure. He's holy. He's without sin. And then darkness represents wickedness, evil, that which is contrary and the opposite of light. So you find that all throughout John's writings. That was kind of his style of writing uh, as the Holy Spirit uh, uh, used him uh, to write these scriptures. And so he is the light of the world. Jesus is. He's the one that came to reveal God's will. Well, it was prophesied in the Old Testament that this would happen. Hold your place here and turn to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 9. And verse 2. Isaiah 9 and verse 2. This is a, a prophecy about the coming of the Messiah. It says in verse 2, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light, and those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. And this is talking about Jesus. The reason why I know, because Matthew 4 and verse 16 tells us that Jesus was fulfilling this prophecy. Matthew 4, 16 says that Isaiah 9 and verse 2 is talking about Jesus. That he would be the light of the world. And therefore, he came to bring light. That gives hope. That gives uh, people direction. Let the lower lights be burning. We sing that song. Uh, be the light of the world. That concept. We, we shine forth the light of Jesus in our life. Matthew 5, when we live for him. Look at Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament. Malachi 4. One of the last prophecies about Jesus was about him being a light. Malachi. Uh, 4, verse 1 and 2 says, For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven. Malachi 4, verse 1. And all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. The day which is coming shall burn them up, says the Lord of hosts. That will leave them neither root nor branch. But, verse 2, to you who fear my name, the Son of Righteousness shall arise with healing in his wings. And you shall go out and grow fat like a stall-fed calves. So talking about the abundant blessings that's going to come upon uh, God's people here. Uh, those who do wickedly, they're going to be punished, verse 2. But those who fear the name of God, Malachi 4 and verse 2, those who respect and honor Him, the Son of Righteousness is coming. This is the S-U-N of righteousness. But we know it's talking about a person because it says uh, in the latter part of the verse, with healing in His wings. That's talking about Jesus. Now, wings, of course, used symbolically to refer to uh, protection, and blessing. He's going to protect us as a, a chicken would protect uh, her chicks. Did he not say that over Jerusalem? Matthew chapter, what, 24? Somewhere in that arena. I would have gathered you together. Matthew 23, the last few verses. I would have gathered you together as a chicken would gather her chicks together under her wings. But you were not willing. Well, that's based upon this prophecy, Malachi 4. He's going to have healing in his wings. And so there is a blessing there. So the Son of Righteousness, S-U-N, is referring to the Son of God, S-O-N. So we have here Jesus being the light of the world. And of course, as I referenced before, uh, John 1 and verse 5, God is light in him is no darkness at all. 1 John, right? 1 John 1, verse 5. God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. And that's the same thing I said about Jesus. You go back to John chapter 1. John chapter 1, when it talks about Christ, before He was born into this world, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. Verse 1, verse 2, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made in Him was life. 
And the light, the life was the light of men. And the light shines in darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. So, there's as many references in John's writings of Jesus being the light, being the light bearer. And here Jesus is saying that he is the light of the world. In John 8 and verse 12. He's going to say it again in uh, chapter 9 when he heals uh, the blind man. And so this, re- this reference or this I am statement is going to come up once again in his teaching. Beginning in verse 13 uh, through 20, you're going to see there is a discussion over Jesus and those who bear witness of him, of who he is. And the, the, the Jewish leadership, the Pharisees here in verse 13, are going to say you're not true because you're your only witness. Verse 13, the Pharisees therefore said to him, you bear witness of yourself, your witness is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I come from and where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh, I judge no one. And yet, if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. Then they said to him, Where is your Father? Jesus answered and said, You know neither me nor my Father, if you had known me you would have known my father also these words jesus spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple and no one laid hands on him for his hour had not yet come there's that phrase again showing it wasn't time for him to die his hour had not yet come now going back up look at the accusation that's being made by the pharisees it says you bear witness of yourself your witness is not true Well, we know that all Pharisees didn't think like that. You go back to John chapter 3, and you see Nicodemus, a Pharisee. He came to Jesus by night, and he said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. So there was an honest Pharisee there that was evaluating the situation and saying, "We, we have to... We, we just conclude that you, you've come from God. Well, these are some of the ones that uh, have rejected that witness. And they say, uh, your witness is not true. If you're, you're just bearing witness of yourself, your witness is not true. Now, Jesus says here in verse 14, even if I bear witness of myself, my witness is true. So Jesus is saying, even if what you're saying is true, If I bear witness of myself, it's still true. You can't say it's not true simply because I am bearing witness of myself. He said there in verse 14, For I know where I came from and where I'm going. You do not know where I came from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh, but I judge no one. And I believe what Jesus is saying here in verse 15 is he doesn't judge the way they judge. Remember, John 7 uh, and verse 24. Do not judge according to appearance, but judge with righteous judgment. Well, they certainly were not righteously judging Jesus. They were looking for him to say or do something they could use against him. And so uh, they were judging according to the flesh. And in verse 16, Jesus said, Yet if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone, but I am with the Father who sent me. So he said, Even if I do judge, my judgment is true. It's righteous judgment, because I am with the Father who sent me. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. Deuteronomy 17 and verse 6 says that. Also Deuteronomy 19 and verse 15. 
I, verse 18, I am one who bears witness of myself, and my Father who also sent me bears witness of me. This is very significant. Not long after the, uh, the church was established and the apostles died and the New Testament was all completed, there was all kinds of false teachers coming up and there was all kinds of theories about the Godhead that came up that were uh, unbiblical. One of those concepts about the Godhead was called modalism. Modalism is the concept of there is but one God who is just one person, but he, he operates in different modes. Kind of like a man can be a husband, he's also a father, he's also a son. One person, but three modes. That was an ancient heresy that was condemned uh, in the uh, ancient world of the, the church. But it was revived during the Pentecostal movement of the early 1900s. It became known as Oneness Pentecostalism. And it is the belief that Jesus is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all in one person. Jesus only, Oneness Pentecostals. Now, not all Pentecostals believe that way. uh, But the Oneness group, subgroup within Pentecostalism believes that way. And the biggest of that group is the United Pentecostal Church. If you ever see a building that says United Pentecostal Church, they believe that. And they believe that Jesus is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit all in one person and just acted in different modes throughout uh, history. Well, this, right, this verse right here along with some we've already looked at in John completely does away with that concept. Because Jesus is saying, how many witnesses are there? Two. Two witnesses. There are two witnesses of Jesus, the Father and the Son. Two witnesses. Now that's based upon the law, Deuteronomy 17, 6, 19, 15. Two witnesses. Now what if I witness a wreck out on 30 and I stop to see if I can help policeman comes up and asks me are you a witness yes I'm two witnesses I as a husband saw the wreck and I as a son saw the wreck therefore there are two witnesses what do you think the officer would want to do he'd probably want to call in back up and put me away because he would think this guy's got split personality there's something wrong with him he thinks he's two people well if I cannot be two witnesses and Jesus is drawing on the principle of you have to have two to bear witness at least two then Jesus is not the father Jesus is not the father he's the son of the father Very good. Very good. Um, He prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane to the Father in heaven. He prayed on the cross, Father, into your hands, I I commit my spirit. He prayed, you know, he's oftentimes said, and we've seen it in John, I have come from the Father, I'm going to go back to the Father. He he is not the Father. And so the, the Bible teaches there is a Godhead consisting of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, And those three within the Godhead are distinct from one another. And so, uh, Jesus here is drawing on that concept. There is a distinction between Him and the Father. He is different. He is distinct from the Father. And so, we have to be careful to uh, understand that distinction. We have to be careful in our prayers. When we pray, it is... The Son who died on the cross, it's not the Father who died on the cross. The Father did not shed His blood for our sins. It was the Son who took on flesh and dwelt among us. John 1 and verse 14. So we have to be very careful when we're praying and understand that distinction. 
And Jesus here is making that distinction here as he draws upon their concept of bearing testimony of something. You have to be at least two witnesses to be true. Okay, if that's the case, verse 18, I am one who bears witness of myself, there's the Son, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me, there's the Father. Now that proves conclusively that He is not the Father. He is distinct from the Father. He bears the same nature as the Father, just as I bear the same nature as my Father. I'm human just like He is. My Son bears the same nature as I do. He's human just like I do. I am. So it's talking about a nature. There is one nature, one God, one divine nature, one Godhead. But there are three who share that nature, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so Jesus here is, is talking about this distinction that is there. We saw that at the very beginning of the gospel account. Look at John chapter 1. John chapter 1 shows there's a distinction within the Godhead. Verse 1, John 1 and verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and was God. When I'm with my wife, I am with a human, and I am human. We share the same nature. So there is that concept of a nature there, and that's what people uh, miss when they see God, they think of a single person, a single divine person. And sometimes it's referring to the nature. There is one God. There is one nature. And therefore, there are three that share that. That's why the Holy Spirit's called God. In John, uh, Acts 5, uh, he is called God. Any questions or comments about that before we go any further? Right, exactly. Exactly. Those three are one. They, they bear witness. Um, exactly, that's exactly what that verse is saying. And that would, not, that would not make any sense whatsoever if modalism were true. If one is Pentecostalism were true, uh, that would not make any sense at all. And so there is a distinction there, and Jesus is recognizing that distinction. And <clears throat> he's saying, I have the Father bearing witness with me. And then in verse 19, he, they say to him, where is your father? Probably thinking of an earthly father. Probably thinking of that in that term, in those terms. Jesus answered and said, You neither know me nor my Father. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And he's going to make it very clear, and he's going to make it very abundantly clear later on in the same chapter, is you don't know God. And you do have a Father. And it's not God. And so this is where the tensions between Jesus and the religious leaders is going to come to a crescendo, so to speak. Verse 20, these words Jesus spoke in the treasury, there would be of the temple area, as he taught in the temple, and no one laid hands on him, for his hour had not yet come. Then in the beginning in verse 21, he's talking about he's going to go back to the Father. He's going back to the Father. And those who don't believe in him, uh, those who are not willing to uh, believe this, this gospel that he's proclaiming, are not going to be able to go with him. Then Jesus said to them again, I am going away and you will seek me and you, and you will die in your sin and where I go you cannot come. So the Jews said, will he kill himself? Because he said, where I go you cannot come. So they're thinking, what's he talking about? Is he talking about suicide here? And he said to them, you are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Now he had already told them they judge according to the flesh in verse 15. Now he's making it very clear 
where he came from. He came from the Father. I am from above. You are from beneath. You are of this world. Uh, You are uh, of this world. I am not of this world. And that should be true of God's people too. We're not of this world. The church is the called out. We're not to be of this world. Verse 24, Therefore I said to you that you will die in your sins, for if you do not believe that I am He, you will die in your sins. Now he's saying, look, you have to identify me and understand who I am and, and believe that I am the Messiah, the Savior, or you're going to die in your sins. He's letting them know that... Uh, he's the only one that can take care of their sin problem. As we're going to see later on, they don't even realize they have a sin problem. Then they said to him, who are you? (laughs) That's almost humorous. I'm like, who are you? You know, they already asked, uh, uh, you know, what are you talking about? Uh, You know, what's, what's going on here? Who is your father? Who are you? Verse 25. Jesus said to them, Just what I have been saying to you from the beginning. So he's repeating some teaching he's already taught them. I have many things to say, and you judge me concerning uh, concerning you. And to judge concerning you. Excuse me. I have many things to say and to judge concerning you. But he who sent me is true, and I speak to the world those things which I heard from him. Again, emphasizing the fact his message is from the Father. They did not understand that he spoke of them of the Father. They didn't understand that. Verse 28, Then Jesus said to them, When you lift up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am he, and that I I do nothing of myself, but as my Father taught me, I speak these things and he who sent me is with me the father has not left me alone for I am always I always do the things that please him as he spoke these words many believed in him now look at verse 28 when you lift up the son of man what's that talking about crucifixion he's predicting now how he's going to die be lifted up And this was already spoken of earlier in in the book, talking about uh, the serpent being lifted up, foreshadowing predictively, uh, Jesus being lifted up. Uh, John 3 and verse 14. John 3 and verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. He's going to be lifted up. And He's letting them know it's going to be by your hands this happens. By your hands this will happen. You will know that I am He and that I do nothing of myself. What was the conclusion of the centurion? who was a Gentile, who witnessed the death of Jesus Christ. Truly, this was a righteous man. Truly, this was the Son of God. When he saw him lifted up and everything that accompanied his death. So, there's a Gentile that could see uh, what was going on and this gospel message. Then, beginning in verse 31... Through 36, he's going to talk about uh, being set free, the true freedom uh, that is there. John 8, verse 31. Then Jesus said to the Jews who believed in him. Now, look at verse 30. It says, uh, those that were there, many believed in him. Now, he's going to address those who did believe. Verse 31. If you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So see, you have to believe in Jesus, but you have to abide in His Word. That means to remain in His teachings. Then you'll be a disciple. And then you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So believing 
doesn't stop there. There has to be the follow-up of abiding. And that's obedient faith. That's doing His will. Remaining in His Word. John 15, He's going to talk about abiding in Him and bearing fruit as a, as a branch in the true vine. We have to abide in Christ. We have to bear fruit. We have to do these works to glorify God. Then we'll be a disciple indeed. That means to be a true disciple. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, We are Abraham's descendants and have never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Jesus answered them said, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin, and a slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. Now going back up to verse 32, this is a a verse that is oftentimes quoted in preaching. The truth shall make you free. And sometimes you hear it in movies and stuff and television shows. You got to tell the truth. You got to confess the truth. Because when you confess this truth, you'll be set free. That burden will be lifted. And they, they, they go to this verse here. Uh, the truth will make you free. And they just think if you have something that you got to tell, you just got to tell it like it is. Tell that truth and you'll be set free. And that's not at all what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about being set free from the bondage of sin. The truth, the gospel truth, will set you free from that. Not just telling the truth on what you saw or what you did in your life. The truth of the gospel is what will set you free. And so he's talking about true uh, freedom, freedom from sin. Freedom from the bondage of sin that we place ourselves in when we sin. This is a bondage we enter into when we violate the will of God. And the only one that can set us free from that is Jesus. Now, it's a very humorous statement they make in verse 33. And it kind of reminds me of the statement that says, if you don't learn from history, you're doomed to repeat it. How could any of those Jews ever say with a straight face, we are Abraham's descendants and never been in bondage to anyone? They were in Egyptian bondage for some 400 years. They were in Babylonian bondage for 70 years. They were under Roman occupation when this conversation was taking place. They were not a free people. They had a little bit of freedom under that Roman occupation to practice things, but uh, they didn't have complete autonomy. They they weren't completely free people, even at that point. So that's just a silly statement to make. We're Abraham's descendants. We've never been in bondage to anyone. How can you say you will be made free? Well, again, they're thinking in earthly terms. He's not talking about freedom from earthly bonds. He's talking about spiritual freedom. Look at verse 34. Jesus answered them, Most assuredly I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. And the slave does not abide in the house forever, but a son abides forever. Therefore, if the son makes you free, you shall be free indeed. You know, as I was studying this, and I listened to what's going on in the news with all of the looting and rioting and the wickedness that's going on because people are mad about a court verdict and the whole concept we want to be free we want to be free what they don't even realize what they're demonstrating when they're acting the way they are acting black or white doesn't matter what color they are they are in the greatest bondage they they can even realize they don't even see it They are in bondage to their anger. They're in bondage to their hatred. They're in bondage to everything that this world has. And yet they want to be free to do whatever they want to do. And that's the backwards nature of this world. That if you think that you're free to do whatever you want to do, you're actually in bondage. The Bible says we are set free in Christ. Set free to do what? God's will. The freedom we have in Christ is the freedom from our past sins so that we can now live for Jesus Christ. 
not freedom to do whatever we want. That creates anarchy. That creates chaos. That creates some of the things we're seeing in our society today. So this freedom that Jesus offers is a freedom from sin, and he talks about this here, and very briefly, Paul talks about this same thing in Romans chapter 6. Look at Romans chapter 6 very briefly. Romans 6 and verse 16. Do you not know that to whom you present yourselves slaves to obey, you are that one slaves whom you obey, whether of sin leading to death or obedience leading to righteousness? Everyone is in bondage or enslaved to someone. It's either uh, sin leading to death, separation from God, or obedience leading to righteousness, a right relationship with God. Verse 17, But God be thanked that you were slaves of sin, yet you obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine to which you were delivered, and having been set free from sin, you became the slaves of righteousness. That form of doctrine is what he talked about in verse 3 and 4. They obeyed the gospel, baptized into Christ, sins washed away by the blood of Christ. Now they're set free to be a slave of righteousness. Not to be uh, set free to do whatever you want. Because if you start doing whatever you want, you'll be in bondage to sin again. You're set free to have the freedom that's in Jesus Christ. A slave of righteousness. Freedom from guilt. Freedom from uh, the past. He says in verse 19, I speak in human terms because of the weakness of your flesh. For just... As you present your members as slaves of uncleanness and lawlessness leading to more lawlessness, so now present your members as slaves of righteousness for holiness. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. Now you have a responsibility to do God's will. So Jesus is talking about the same thing that Paul's talking about here when he talks about uh, freedom. Jesus sets people free. And when they obey the gospel, they are set free by the blood of Jesus Christ to be the people God wants them to be. And that will lead to an eternal happiness. That will lead to greater pleasures that this world could never even touch in comparison. We will stop right there, and uh, next week, uh, Lord willing, uh, it will be our singing night. I got that straight this time. And um, then those who want to stay afterwards can see in the new year.